a day called Logan's Run. Well, the word has come out again and again at the studio and at the network where they're talking about doing another Logan's Run. And that sometimes is that full volume, sometimes it's just a whisper. But Bill and I have noticed that, and so each of us set out to write a sequel to our co-authored novel, Logan's Run. Mine is called Jessica's Run, and I've put a lot of Jessica's Run on paper for the purpose of pulling it out swiftly when the word comes down. And the word will be the remaking of Logan's Run. Bill, of course, doing the same thing with various people to it. The agents that we speak with are all very hot and enthusiastic over it because, like us, they sense this could be a signal event. So, while doing that, I consider myself a man who, who makes a living without having a job. Mm -hmm. And so comes the important part of that thing, which is make a living. So now, what the hell do I do? I'm trapped here by Logan's Run, waiting for it either to not work or to work. And if it does, hooray, hooray. And if it doesn't, that's sort of far for the course. It may be delayed. They may come up with some other plan. But in the meanwhile, I have a piece of writing called Jessica's Run, just sort of to keep my hand in the game of being a writer with stuff that I'm writing. Because it's very easy to be a writer. Because nobody pins you down and says, what the hell have you written? What did you write yesterday? I didn't write anything yesterday. I make a living by being a writer. Writers don't have to write. They have to be writers. So, that's bewildering, I'm sure. But there is hidden in there a little bit of wisdom. Who would voluntarily choose in this competitive world where it takes money to pay the rent and to buy the groceries and, you know, all of that? Why would you take a job where there is no money? Because there's no money in being a writer. I've had a couple of fairly large checks, but basically it's all sweating it out, waiting for it to happen. And oftentimes it doesn't happen at all, while three or four other things happen. And part of it is continuing not to abuse your talent. As I write stuff down for me when I'm not working for them, whoever them are. So now, It's hard to figure out just what to talk about here. There's a future for me, and the future is I'm going to get returned more famous because I'm a writer. And it doesn't really much matter what I get around to writing because there's all kinds of power in Hollywood. One of the really great powers is access. Well, I have that. I can call up Mr. Big Shop, the head of the story department, and ask for an interview or a talk or a meeting, and I'll get it because I'm him. I'm the guy from out of town. But that name, George Clayton Johnson, has been what I've been protecting, what I've been adding to, what I've been uh, trying to make a mark of honor sometime, something important, and surprising the number of people that I deal with to whom it is important because they've read those books or those stories or they've seen my name on the silver screen or whatever it is that I've done through all of these years of being a writer in almost all media including things I do for just for me. 
I am developing a project called The Devil's Picture Book. And uh, that is one of the names that folk wisdom has given to the deck of playing cards. The poker deck, the devil's picture book. Each one of those numbers and symbols represents a character of four basic types. The stage of the thought, for any power, the heart circling motion, the diamonds are for glitter and attractiveness, and the unusual. And uh, as you see, the more you examine the ordinary deck of playing cards, the greater information is revealed to you, hidden so cleverly in everything, the symbols, the colors, the number of cards, why 52? For 52 weeks in a year. Why a joker? Because there's always that week here. You know, that you uh, start to look at the playing cards as I have done for several years now, while developing a series and a couple of very important stories, which, for my own convenience, I call the Devil's Picture Book. But as you can see, there's a TV series here. Very easy to deal out a hand of cards and see them as people. For an example, I wonder which example I should do. Because, uh, because there are 52 of them. But in any event, I have conceived of characters to represent these playing cards. And they inhabit a universe with four symbols, basic ideas that are represented by the symbolism in the head. And that there's been an awful lot of attention paid to the tarot, which is one deck of cards, but surprisingly little to this other deck, which apparently came into existence in about the 14th century. But, which is fairly recent times, considering any other literary document. I consider uh, the deck of cards a literary document. And to uh, have conceived of ways to explore the power of the numbers. And a lot of it is given away just by the way they are drawn. You know, why does the king of hearts have his sword behind his head? Hold it back here, but you can't see it. You can see the handle on the tip is hidden, the blade. Why the king of hearts? What is hearts associated with? Emotion, stays with logic, clubs with power, with doom. And you see that repeated in the Fantastic Four, example of it in comic books. Very many people throughout the world are very, very aware of the power of that number four and how it, uh, how it relates to our psychological lives. Not quite sure what I just said then, but <laughs> I, I felt like I was going somewhere for a few moments. <laughs> anyway, uh, what can I tell you about the deck, other than that it provided me with hours of amusement as I look at these cards and try to figure out just where is this person at? In what way is the four of spades different than the four of clubs? You know? Four is the number of order. Three is the number of completion. Seven is the number of mystery. These cards and numbers intertwine throughout a whole series of mystical studies like numerology. And uh, it's a funny thing also that all of these decks of cards no matter where they're made, they look alike. Somehow there's a wonderful uniformity in the stage arts, clubs, and diamonds, and in the numbers up to the face cards, and the numbers of the face cards. You know, it's, uh, there, if you applied some of the logic and the rules of numerology to the card deck, you'd be surprised 
how even the design of where to put the kids, you know, there's a lot of ways you could make the fire. Four over to one of the six, the fire. Well, the six, anyway, I, I, I don't want to get lost in this. The basic idea for me to communicate to you is that I use the ordinary deck of cards as a device for evoking thinking about stories, about character relationships. You know, if you put this card in a room with that card, and they had to confront, who would win? You know, would it be intuition, the diamonds? Or would it be brute force, the gloves? Or would it be steamy smartness from the stage? So, anyway, I give it to your attention. Take a look at the card deck the next time you have some time and start asking your questions about what is it this way? You know, what about these queens? Every one of them is carrying a flower of some kind. Often it's the four of the flower. What is all this about? And you find out that it's uniform. Go from deck to deck to deck, manufacturer to manufacturer, and they're all very much enslaved in that one pattern. And that's because that pattern contains an awful lot of hidden smart stuff, wisdom, uh, insight, knowledge. And uh, they have very odd names. The Four of Clubs is, no, the Four of Spades is called Cupid's Darts Useless. <laughs> I looked them up, they have traditional names that go back for hundreds of years. And which the, the, the Three of Arts is known as La Dama, the Lady. You know, and uh, so anyway, these cards are are a uniform system of knowledge that I think is worth penetrating, but that none of us ever sees because it's just a children's toy. But I think a surprising number of children's toys are much more than you see. For example, hopscotch. <laughs> I think we're looking at a very, very important thing when we see that there's two, and this, and I stick it this way, and then one, and then two again, and then three. And it's always that way on every playground. But you look at it, and it has an awful lot of appearance to me of uh, mm -hmm. diagrams regarding mystical wisdom. So, such is my little conversation. <laughs> I've closed your attention long enough, I think. But I, an awful lot of my spare time is spent thinking about things like, why is the echo Christ like it is? Why did we inherit it this way? Why do we slavishly repeat it? And what kind of information is in it? Because I believe that if there were wise men, and they found out some great secret, and they wanted to perpetuate it. The only and the best way to do it <coughs> is to hide it in the children's game, which is what I think Hopscotch is. I think there's a great deal to do it with the tarot and other important documents and diagrams that have been researched by intensely intelligent people to try to represent the human mind of the human spirit, you know, and uh, anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>